So panel five is UNCLOS in a Changing World, and we are uh, honored and privileged to have Ms. Valentina Germani, um, who is a senior legal officer in the Division for Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea, Office of Legal Affairs of the UN in New York, where she has worked since 2001. Um, her current assignments focus mostly on capacity building, in particular as the program advisor of the UN Nippon Foundation programs and on ocean and climate change. Um, without further ado, I will uh, pass over the stage to um, Ms. Germani with a, a brief reminder to the Zoom participants to please mute yourself, uh, use speaker view, and um, uh, put questions in the chat as and when they arise. And to all our participants here, if you could kindly turn off all your mobile phones and devices, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I can hear my voice uh, in the conference room, so I assume that you can all hear me as well. Uh, Your Excellency, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to panel five. I wish to thank the organizers of the conference, and in particular, Ambassador Tommy Ko and the director of the Center for International Law, Dr. Nilufer Olal, for kindly inviting me to be the moderator of this panel. I am also pleased to convey to them and to all participants the greetings from the Division for Ocean Affairs and the Law of the Sea at the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs. Indeed, it's, it's a great pleasure to see many colleagues and friends in the room, even remotely from, uh, from New York. Uh, it's a, a great pleasure again to be here with you all to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. As many of you would know, our division is the Secretariat of the Convention, as well as the Fish Talks Agreement, and we provide support on behalf of the Secretary General to many of the United Nations processes dealing with oceans and the law of the sea, including the BBNJ Intergovernmental Conference. Hence, this uh, anniversary uh, of UNCLOS and the teams of this conference are very close to our interest, and in many cases also the focus of our work. Before we turn to look at UNCLOS in the context of our changing world, which is the, the theme of this uh, panel, let me just uh, uh, mention that the convention is, of course, a product of its times. It was negotiated, uh, as we all know, during the 1970s and early 1980s. And of course, it reflects the understanding and the issues that were of interest to the negotiators at the time, also using the vocabulary in news at the time. Today, we're uh, going to discuss the capacity of the convention to withstand the test of time and to continue to provide the legal framework for oceans and seas in our changing and continuously evolving world. It may be worth remembering that the convention as a framework convention is characterized by an inherent flexibility, thanks to its explicit reliance on complementary instruments not only those that were pre-existing, but also those negotiated to deal with issues that have emerged since 1982. And we heard quite a lot about these in the previous panel. And I think it's also important to, uh, to recall that in fact, uh, Ambassador Ko not only skillfully led to the conclusion, uh, successful conclusion of the third conference on the law of the sea, he also very usefully referred to the character of the convention as a constitution for the oceans. So just like other constitutions, UNCLOS was primarily intended to set out the legal framework within which all activities in the oceans and seas are to be carried out. This is consistently recognized by the United Nations General Assembly in its annual resolutions on oceans and the law of the sea, which are adopted with the support of both parties to UNCLOS and non-parties, at least most of them. This also demonstrates how states continue to view the convention as the constitution of the oceans. Let's turn now to our panel. Uh, we're very fortunate to have here with us four experts in oceans and the law of the sea. 
to discuss without, with us UNCLOS in a changing world. And also to present uh, a number of very current challenges. I'm going to briefly introduce our four panelists, uh, but I would like to recall that their detailed biographies are available on the conference website. Also, please note that there is a, a small change in the order of the presentations. Uh, so we will start uh, with our first speaker being uh, Associate Professor Liu, who is Director of the Center for Environmental Law at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. He will talk to us about UNCLOS and part 12 on the protection and preservation of the marine environment. Our second speaker will be Associate Professor Lyons, a Senior Research Fellow with the Ocean Law and Policy Program of the Center for International Law at the National University of Singapore. She will speak about UNCLOS and solving the marine plastics crisis. Professor Schofield, who is the head of research at the WNU Sasakawa Global Ocean Institute at the World Maritime University in Malmo, Sweden, will be our third speaker and he will address sea level rise. And our fourth speaker, Professor Esposito from the Universitat Autonoma de Madrid, where he is Professor of Public International Law, he will talk to us about technology and angles. Thank you to all of our panelists for being here with us today. I wish I could be sitting there at the table with you, but it's very nice to see you all even from, uh, from afar. So let's start uh, uh, without further ado with the presentations. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce to you Associate Professor Liu. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, first, I would like to uh, Sincerely thank uh, Professor Nilovara, Professor Tomiko, and also I would like to congratulate the Center for International Law team for organizing such a wonderful conference, at least historical moment, um, and for having and also for having me here. It's pretty much like a, a dream coming true, you know, uh, after two years to have this precious moment of in-person conference. So I thank you all for giving me this opportunity. And um, um, uh, today I'm going to talk about the UNCLOS and the protection of the marine environment. Yes, so when we are talking about the marine environmental protection in the context of the UNCLOS, what are we really talking about? In my view, based on just, let's say, a, a, a serious uh, look into the text of the Part 12, I think we could fairly say that the essence, the, the essential part of the part 12 is about uh, marine pollution. So we have seen these uh, pictures, very familiar, uh, very familiar pictures uh, across the media. And also, I think it's very kind of a, actually a common kind of phenomenon in many uh, international conventions and treaties these days that we, we, they, they actually don't define what is environment. What the UNCLOS does define is the pollution of the marine environment. That's it's Article 1, Paragraph 4. As I just read it out, it means the introduction by man, yeah, I take it, directly and or indirectly the substances or energy into uh, the marine environment. And as several speakers mentioned uh, previously, that yes, indeed, I mean, UNCLOS, the part 12 does touch upon the frail or fragile ecosystems and as well as the habitat of the depleted, threatened or endangered species. But what exactly does that mean? I think that's subject to debate. So now you ask me whether the UNCLOS is a success after 40 years. I think it's a very successful, con a very successful uh, convention because see how much people in this room and beyond are making a living by teaching and research law of the sea. So, <laughs> and it is truly a living convention, isn't it? Because you can make a living by, by, by doing it after 40 years. But seriously, when it comes to the, the marine environmental protection, what we really see, I, I, I think what I, I really uh, see as very successful uh, in this kind of part 12 are two aspects. The first as aspect, as also uh, the previous panelist in, in the previous panel mentioned, is it does set up a number of fundamental principles. 
That's very important because principles last. And so Article 192, the contracting parties, they do carry the fundamental obligation to protect marine environment, and not to mention other principles, the transboundary harm, and environmental and monitoring assessment, which is Article 204 and 206, which is now being further discussed and debated in the BBJ in the BBNJ negotiation regarding the environmental impact assessment. So that's the first aspect of successful uh, Part 12. And the second aspect is it does establish a very delicate balance. I mean, UNCLOS is all about balance, as we teach uh, the law of the sea to students. We know, I think people, most people in this room know that it's all about balance. But in particular, when it comes to the protection of marine environment, there has been a very delicate, delicate balance between flag, coastal, and port state. And under this kind of jurisdictional framework, we have seen a especially when it comes to address the vessel source pollution because shipping has an industry, has an international nature. It has been a massive success, a massive success, uh, be it operational pollution from shipping or uh, accidental pollution from shipping. When it comes to land-based pollution, as we discussed, well, here the sovereignty comes in. So when sovereignty comes in, things are a bit different. So that's where we are. But we are now in 2022, and this panel is about UNCLOS in a changing world. And now, after 40 years, we are living in, at least I can feel personally, that we are living in a fundamentally different world. That is what some call the telecoupled world. Yeah, we talked about globalization. Yeah, we talked about globalization for a long time. But globalization is about interaction between human systems. And as you know, that ocean is a tele-connected tele kind of system that has actually no natural boundaries. So the natural systems, they interact each other. But what we are living now is, and as the pandemic has reminded us, is the boundaries between the, na the natural systems and the human systems, they are blurred. They are very much blurred. And thanks to the, well, thanks to the, uh, advancement of technology, uh, we are now living in a telecoupled world which is hyper-connected. What, what's published in a local media in Sydney could raise a serious kind of diplomatic issue in Beijing. So think about that. That's happening every day. So we do live in a very different world. And so while we are now living in a telecoupled world, I think also now it is time to think carefully when we are talking about marine environmental protection, what exactly are we trying to protect? So in 2019, the intergovernmental, uh, intergovern intergovernmental science policy platform on biodiversity and ecosystem service, the IFBES, published a very useful well, and also distressful report on the IPBES global assessment on biodiversity. And some of the key findings here is, first, nature underpins human existence and a good quality of life and what makes life worth living. So when we are talking about protecting, protecting the nature, we are actually protecting our sustainable lifestyle. And when people talk about sustainability, sustainability all the time, but what does that mean? And also, and unfortunately, because, our, because of our current living uh, lifestyle and the industrialization and urbanization, some would say that we are now facing a sixth mass extinction. And think about that. One million species, if nothing changes, has and or will extinct within decades. So now when we are talking about marine in the environmental protection in the marine context, what I see would, would, where we should look beyond the marine pollution issue is to develop a legal system that can address those major drivers for the marine biodiversity loss. Because while the, once, we lost, once we lose the biodiversity, there is, they won't come back. So climate change might be reverted, reduce the CO2 emission, but once we lose a species, we lose them forever. So that's the issue here. So, what are the major drivers for the marine biodiversity loss? First and foremost, direct exploitation of species, overfishing. So fishing is not just an economic or social issue. It is a key environmental issue. And so, I mean, to, li to leave fisheries 
behind the BBNJ negotiation, for me, it's like, what exactly are you going to protect for? I mean, you protect a marine environment without fish. That's not even worth to be protected. And the second uh, direct driver is the change in sea use. And here we talk about this large-scale industrialized uh, marine farms in the aquaculture industry. Like, for example, now in China, uh, the aquaculture provides more protein uh, to human beings than the fishing industry. But the problem is, well, those aquaculture, large marine farms, they could also fundamentally alter, if not destroy, the original marine ecosystem. And then climate change, of course, coral bleaching. In Australia, we know this very well in the Great Barrier Reef. And pollution, here comes pollution. Pollution is important. Pollution has been comprehensively addressed in the part 12 text of the UNCLOS. And pollution is important, but what is really going on now is, is the plastic, as you know, we'll, we'll talk more about it. And finally, invasive species. All right, invasive species, that's also a, a very major driver for the marine biodiversity loss. All right, now we know the marine the drivers and how could we develop the UNCLOS. Here, what I call this approach as the UNCLOS Plus approach. And just to, uh, just to be very clear, the UNCLOS in Part 12 does provide the legal basis for that because Article 237, uh, Paragraph 1, provides clearly that the provisions of this part are without prejudice to the specific obligations assumed by states under special conventions and agreements that are kind of, that which may be concluded in furtherance of the general principles set forth in this convention. So I see there are three models. People have been discussing three models. First is uh, the implementing agreement and second being the rule of reference, like the IMO, and third is the regime interaction, like Paris Agreement, uh, and also the Marine Plastic Treaty, uh, the Plastic Treaty to be negotiated. Just bear with me a few kind of uh, personal observations uh, regarding the BBNJ uh, negotiation, uh, in particular because I was in New York and last over the past two weeks, and I, I think so far there is a very much a missed opportunity there because the, the BBNJ is about intergovernmental conference on marine biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. But if you read the latest draft negotiation text, they don't define marine biodiversity. They only define marine genetic resources, marine genetic, uh, uh, marine genetic uh, materials. But that's different. That's different. So when you when you miss that out, then how can you ensure that this is, this is, uh, this is uh, going to be a new implementing agreement to, to ensure the conservation and sustainable use of the marine, living, uh, marine biodiversity? And also, I mean, I'll just give you like one example that uh, when it comes to the environmental impact assessment, uh, I have heard constantly in the room that major powers, those who have capacities to conduct activities in, at the sea, uh, would emphasize the EIA will be a state-led and state-centered approach. Yes, that's fine, but what does that mean? That means to apply national legislation to the, to the national legislation of the EIA to the high sea projects. And then there is no international body that has the competence to approve or reject those kind of, pro those kind of uh, activities. And to me, personally, as an academic, I see, this, uh, I see this as a new type of the freedom of the high seas in this come is changing world. So there are, there are really issues there. But I think here what I, I'm trying to say is like, when we are talking about UNCLOS and to address the marine environment protection, I think we do need to look beyond. And then that's the question that I asked it, uh, Tara yesterday. It's like, okay, we talk about all these issues, regime interaction, rules of reference, what for? I think if we can develop, if we can be guided with these drivers, and then develop, be it regime detection, rules of reference, or implement, implementing agreement towards that, that direction to address those ma major drivers of the marine biodiversity loss, and then try to save the ocean that can underpin our sustainable lifestyle. I think that would be the, the guiding of the guiding principle for this kind of uh, UNCLOS uh, plus approach. And, Finally, uh, just bear with me, and because I, 
I, I ought to say this, and this is beyond unclose. This is beyond unclose. And also, there are some, recommend, some recommendations uh, provided by the ABES uh, report. That is, I just, that is, how could we develop international law that is based on a different value to facilitate transformative change? We do need it. I mean, our lifestyle cannot continue. I, I'm, I just give you one simple personal example that I'm horrified by my new uh, hobby of ordering Uber Eats, which accompanied by this single-used uh, plastics, I mean, in Sydney and New York, not in Singapore. And I noticed that all these food calls, uh, the, the utensils are actually uh, uh, reusable, which is really good. So, I mean, this just, just one example. This neoliberalized kind of economy, economic uh, uh, model gave us one second of convenience, but then those single-use marine plastics ended up with long-lasting impact on the environment. And is that really worth kind of having this kind of approach? So, I mean, this is something I think people tend not to talk about it, but I do think we need to talk about it, and we need, we need to really, and if we don't talk about it, then we don't know where to change. So, to to kind of like to transform, and also that's where what our, our Center for Environmental Law at Macquarie University uh, these days uh, is trying to do, is tr really to develop a different kind of law based on different values that can really ensure that we have a sustainable future. So that is something what we call the transformative change, because transformative change can be very negative as well. So people use this neutral word, but what we are trying to transform is to transform the international law or law, or law of the sea towards a, a seriously uh, sustainable future. So here are the kind of the uh, list of recommendations that, uh, that some are, are, are provided by the best assessment, some are, are further kind of uh, are developed by ourselves, but uh, I will just leave it here, leave it here uh, bear in mind uh, my time, and I welcome uh, your questions and comments uh, at a later stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yu, and thank you for uh, uh, starting this panel by uh, helping us reflect on what it is that we're talking about when we think about the protection and preservation of the marine environment. Um, we looked at the success of uh, part 12, maybe not so much in defining what environment or the marine environment uh, constitutes, but by providing other uh, useful definition of marine pollution. And of course, you noted that um, ANCLOS part 12 fo focuses on the problem of marine pollution, as I was also mentioning at the beginning, ANCLOS is the product of its time. So of course, the focus at the time um, or the major preoccupations in terms of uh, marine environmental protection was um, marine pollution. So that became the, the focus. But of course, you also talked about the success in establishing a fundamental principle that trans transcend time and therefore will hopefully continue to withstand um, the, the passing times. Um, you also introduced a concept that to me was very new and very interesting, the telecoupled world. Um, and, and it's very interesting how you talk to us about the oceans being a, a connected system, um, but also our world becoming more and more uh, uh, connected. Thank you uh, to technology uh, advancement. And so in all of these interconnectedness, what is it that we're, uh, that we're trying to protect? And uh, you gave us uh, the very um, preoccupying key findings of uh, IPES in terms of what we are doing uh, to our uh, biodiversity, including marine biodiversity, and how by losing biodiversity and by not sustainably managing and conserving biodiversity, we're also um, damaging our own sustainable development. Other concept that I just want to mention before uh, we move on is this concept that you presented on uh, focusing on major drivers to then uh, build on UNCLOS and create is what you call the UNCLOS Plus. And you mentioned, of course, as uh, ma major uh, drivers, exploitation of resources, change CUs, climate change, plastic pollution and invasive species, um, calling for a transformative change to address these, uh, uh, these drivers. So we can uh, perhaps now move to our uh, uh, next presentation, which is in fact a very good follow-up 
um, from what you were talking, Professor Liu, about uh, uh, drivers. And so I'm very pleased to pass the microphone now to our, to our second speaker, uh, Associate Professor Yuna Lyons, uh, talking to us about marine plastics. Please, you have the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is it? No. Am I close enough? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so good morning. And um, so Professor Tomiko, all my bosses, <laughs> um, uh, PhD supervisors, um, <laughs> colleagues, uh, it's, um, well, very, very nice to be here to talk a bit about our, our, our work with, uh, with the centre. And I'm delighted to have found this um, discussion is extremely stimulating and it's certainly wonderful to finally be in a meeting where we can directly talk to people and actually nearly touch them. Um, so uh, I will be talking about the plastic crisis in the context of the implementation of, um, of UNCLOS, looking at it a little bit like a, a case study uh, for the discussions we had on coordination between uh, competent international organization. Um, so maybe the announcement that uh, by 2050 uh, there will be more plastic than uh, fish in the oceans uh, and the number of tons of plastics that are reaching the oceans daily have convinced you that um, plastic crisis is the greatest threat on the marine environment. Or maybe you think that climate change and ocean acidification are worse threats or uh, maybe you are especially concerned with the loss of biodiversity and overfishing especially beyond national jurisdiction. The approach I would like um, uh, to take with you today is uh, that the worst problem is the com combined effect of all of these processes and our um, difficulty um, to effectively take these combined effects um, into account. So are we now going to, um, to consider the, the plastic crisis um, uh, in the context of the degradation of the marine environment with a particular focus uh, of the marine plastic crisis in the context of the implementation of UNCLOS. Uh, so we're going to examine how it is an illustration of the flexibility and relevance of the provision of UNCLOS, but also how the systemic procedural frictions and resistance that can... Um, that are encountered can interfere with um, its full implementation. So um, let's start with some facts to uh, show the complexity of responding adequately to pollution from marine plastic, starting with where are marine plastic debris and uh, what they are composed of. So as you well know, um, our world is full of plastic in, of all types, um, for all kinds of uses, and uh, our oceans are full of it too, um, everywhere. Asia is the largest producer of um, plastic, raw plastic products, um, and we are also very numerous in Asia and opinions of plastic. Finally, much of the plastic waste from other parts of the world also comes to us. Um, uh, different parts of, uh, of the region. So it cannot come as a surprise that all estimates indicate that all the marine environment of the region is particularly full of plastic. However, it's important to, re to remember, as this um, map also shows, that the rest of the world is also. Um, now, do these marine plastic debris, where do these marine plastic debris come from? We have always thought that much originated from land, and data is confirming this, flowing from rivers, water tables and underground easements, brought by the wind, rain, storms, flooding events, runoffs, leakage from landfills, coastal landfills, many of them in the region, building sites on the coast in particular, agriculture activities is a major source of marine plastics, and more. Now, surveying for marine plastic has also shown that a substantial quantity of marine plastics come from sea-based pollution. And locally, there is even a dominance of fisheries-related plastic debris that have been found. 
This is the case, for example, of the findings from sampling of floating debris in the Great Pacific garbage patch. Other sources of sea-based pollution are aquaculture activities, locally extremely substantial, shipping as waste from vessels, plastic fibers from grey water, microplastic from paint, we now know, um, on the hull of vessels, tourism, offshore activities, and etc. Plastic debris come from come in all size, sizes, shapes, color, texture, and fortunately, they also come with toxic chemicals used for the making of polymers to reinforce them, give them color, or for other reasons. Once in the marine environment, plastic debris can also attract particular bacteria, pathogens, and chemicals that can get ingested by organisms, creating new potential adverse impacts. Scientific surveys of pollution from marine plastic and research on the fate of marine plastic is still developing, and all questions are not answered. However, we now know that plastic is ingested by most organisms of all sizes. Some stain the guts and other parts of uh, bodies of organisms, interfering with their development, ability to eat and function properly. It also kills them. Other plastic particulates get expelled by marine organisms, actually, and then they get fractioned into smaller pieces. From, that's one of the way we go from microplastic to nanoplastics. But then they get ingested again by other smaller organisms. We also know that the visible part of marine plastic is a minuscule fraction of the loading of plastic in the ocean. Maybe one or two percent at the surface only. There is more in the water column, but even more on the seabed. Concentrations of plastic are also greater in proximity to areas which are inhabited and heavily populated. The thinking is now that overall, most plastic debris actually do not travel that far, and a large majority would sink close to the coast. Although this hypothesis is obviously still being scrutinized, that it has great repercussions. So now it's time to put our legal hat on. To combat pollution from iron plastics, regulatory action can be envisaged at a number of stages. From extraction of the raw material to production, use, trade, and action does not start at the marine environment, but in the context of UNCLOS, we do. So we are going to focus to the downstream part of plastic pollution. I mean pollution from marine plastics in the marine environment, rather than really, marine, rather than just the plastic crisis as a whole. Several provisions of UNCLOS are applicable to pollution from marine plastics. First, it seems quite clear that um, despite not being specially named in the definition of pollution, plastic is included as a substance, a substance which may have a number of deleterious effects which are included in the definition. Pollution from marine plastics also falls within the scope of the general provisions of Article 192, 292, and 193, 194, and are particularly, these general provisions are particularly useful um, for activities that do not have their specific uh, pollution provisions. Other applicable prov provisions are those of the protection of the rare, fragile ecosystems and of the habitat of depleted, threatened, and endangered species which can be particularly vulnerable to marine plastic pollution, especially if they are already under stress, for instance, climate change. Provisions on monitoring and environmental assessment also apply, of course, and the implementation of all those provisions is, however, another matter, especially where there is no intergovernmental body in charge. I tried here to provide a visual overview, and you see, I think we have to call them horondograms, of the institutional landscapes for the making of international law on pollution from marine plastics. They are grouped by sector and topic areas with the UN and UNCLOS at the top. 
Bodies are in gray, instruments are in green. So you see UNIA, UNEP, UNESCO and the IOC on general environment and science, the IMO on chipping with uh, its Marine Environmental Protection Committee, the MEPC, uh, and the subcommittee PPR, its subcommittee, um, which have been both working separately on marine plastics on different aspects, uh, the um, FAO and COFI, uh, which have also focused on plastic from fishing activities, particularly fishing gear, the bodies of the London Convention and London Protocol on Dumping, um, the Basel Conference of the Parties and Instruments on the Trade of Plastics Waste, as well as the Triple COP. And last but not least, all the bodies and instruments that are concerned with um, the protection of marine life. There are many of them, and they all discuss the impact of plastic on the species they're concerned with. You can see a number of working groups on plastic under different bodies, and yet, for these simplified horondogram and instruments, I have left out regional bodies and instruments that also work on marine plastics. It's a very busy world when it comes to plastic. And in fact, um, as I'm talking to you, this, well, not now, but last night, I missed the um, uh, scientific group meeting, working group meeting on plastic of London Convention, London Protocol, um, which is happening this week. So a few words now on um, the new plastic uh, treaty in the making, thanks to uh, the establishment of UNIA in 2012, serious work has been able to develop to respond to the plastic crisis. And this discussion, but this discussion goes way beyond marine plastics, fortunately, as the plastic crisis is not one that starts in the marine environment, this is where it ends. I'm sure that you all know that UNIA 5.2, which has concluded, has adopted a resolution um, to end plastic pollution towards an international legally binding instrument. The exact scope and content of these future instruments is yet to be negotiated, um, but there is an ambitious target of 2014 for an agreement. On the basis of the wording of the resolution, we can be very hopeful that Article 200, 207 may actually see an implementation um, and uh, uh, many more uh, provisions will come. Now, while this is developing, I would like to share with you, in the few minutes I have left, um, the discussions, discussions that have happened at the International Maritime Organization and London Convention, London Protocol. They're based on my own observation um, in attending those meetings and participating to these various working groups. So we already know that MARPOL Annex 5, we already have regulation, MARPOL Annex 5 uh, prevents the disposal of plastic waste from shipping. Um, but following the, um, the IMO assembly in 2017 and concerned on plastic, there was um, a, uh, the, the IMO assembly decided to take on plastic. And there had been papers that had been submitted by states that were referred to the MEPC for consideration. That led to a new agenda item being um, added. Uh, at the MEPC and we started dealing with plastic. In this context, um, we worked on the development of um, a roadmap uh, and there's a strategy uh, going on at the moment. There's a number of issues that have been identified and those have been uh, very adequately and we see here perfect, quite ideally, uh, ideal um, implementation of UNCLOS in that the MEPC was able to send to, uh, to PPR in order to have uh, discussion on, um, for in, especially on fisheries gear. Um, and the difficulty now is that we have a friction between the FAO and the IMO, and some would say that um, the IMO instruments are ill-suited for the mandatory um, marking of fishing gear, and this needs to be simply an FAO discussion. So it's a little bit of a back and forth. A number of states are actually pushing for this to be done. Um, the guidelines of MARPOL and X5 are already actually dealing with ALDFG, so the, uh, uh, the abandoned or discarded, or well, <laughs> abandoned. Can somebody help me with the, with the, uh, with the acronym? Abandoned, discarded fishing gear, loss, anyway, you know those ones that have been abandoned at sea. 
The, the point is that when they put in the sea, when they place that sea, they are not waste yet. But then later on, they become waste and they are abandoned. So then this, led, this leads also to another discussion, and that brings me to the, the, in the context of London Convention, London Protocol. Because um, in the context of this body, once a, um, a fishing gear have been abandoned, they uh, can be considered to be dumped. And as a result, they, a, a license would be necessary if it is at all, at all possible to abandon them. So it is also an item which is discussed in the context of the working group of the London Convention and the London Protocol. Can the MEPC and PPR uh, working group actually join hands with the working group of the um, London Convention and London Protocol? Well, procedurally not, unless we put in, and this is now in the work, there is in the same way that there has been um, the ILO and FAO uh, and IMO who have been organizing joint discussion in the context of IUU, the same is possible, of course, on plastic. That's going to take another six months or another year. And the difficulties that's encountered in the context of the discussion in all of those bodies is that when you're working in a working group, you have terms of reference. Thus, these terms of reference are the limit of what this body can determine. The, um, the, the treaty under which the committee is operating is also setting the frame in the context of which the decisions can be taken. Do we ever talk about unclause? Never. Is it possible to mention uh, unclause? Um, a few of us have tried, but we have not, we've generally been pushed out by a number of states in the room. In fact, unclause is not, cannot be discussed at, in the context of those, of those bodies. So that leads to uh, my, uh, really, it's, it's not the, conclu the conclusion slide, but it's, the, it's, it's a sufficient one because it leads, it's really the difficulty is this, is the coordination in practice. Even when we have the instruments and we have the treaties and we think we are in the best possible position to actually handle the difficulties that we're facing, in fact, there are uh, the very mechanisms that we have put in place in order to to uh, make these bodies operational, which can come in the way of being efficient and fast enough in responding to environmental threats. So, and when you look at cumulative impact, it's even harder. You're looking at paint from uh, the hull of vessels. At the scale of one vessel, it's very little. But what about the scale of all the vessels? And what if, the, as the microplastic actually coming from those vessels comes in addition to other threats which are dealt with by other bodies? So I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lyons. And I think in the interest of time, because I want to have enough time also for our uh, question and answer session, I will not uh, attempt to fully summarize the, the presentation. We just heard it and uh, Professor Lyons was very eloquent, but uh, I think just uh, uh, very interesting uh, how you talked about the institutional horrendograms, another, uh, uh, another term that I'm learning today and uh, with the UN at the top of it. <laughs> um, and, um, and in fact, uh, jokes aside, uh, it is indeed, uh, as you pointed out at the end of your presentation, uh, a complex issue to, uh, uh, to generate meaningful collaboration across the different organizations uh, and frameworks that deal, for example, with the problem of, uh, of plastics uh, at sea. And you gave us the example of uh, um, lost, abandoned and discarded fishing gear and uh, possible interrelations between the IMO instruments, the FAO and the London Convention. So indeed, uh, a very complex uh, set of issues. And uh, but you reminded us that UNEA has, uh, of course, recently decided to start the negotiation for a new international instrument which will deal with the overall uh, issue of uh, plastics, not only at sea, but uh, uh, from land to oceans. So thank you very much again, uh, uh, Professor uh, Lyons. And now um, we can move to our uh, third presentation. Uh, Professor Schofield, it is my pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Valentina. Um, Your Excellencies, distinguished um, judges, 
uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends. What an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, I've been very much looking forward to this particular uh, event, the opportunity to once again uh, be together, or at least many of us, if not all of us. Uh, profound thanks to uh, Professor, Ambassador, President retired, uh, uh, Tommy Coe, um, also to Professor or Director um, Nilofar Oral, and uh, to the one known as uh, in these parts as simply as Prof, or Professor Robert Beckman, thank you. And not forgetting the fabulous CIL team, Dr. Tara, who is already threatening me with the, the legendary CIL bell. Um, Dieter, Pia, Matthew, uh, and Supreme Leader, Jerry. Um, thank you for this great opportunity for, uh, to gather together to critique and indeed celebrate uh, 40 years of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. It feels like at least 40 months since we'd have this type of opportunity, although that's only a slight exaggeration, I, I suppose. Um, without further ado, I'd like to turn to my presentation. I, Yuna's presentation that we just heard is, is felt really quite scary and depressing. I, I, I'm sorry if I'm going to continue that, that theme in looking at sea level rise as perhaps an unanticipated challenge when the convention was being drafted. And it's often suggested that the, uh, the drafters of the convention were effectively unaware of climate change impacts and particularly the impacts of climate change on sea level. Uh, and there was a presumption uh, that sea level was essentially stable. Dynamic coastlines, for sure, uh, with natural erosive and depositional processes changing uh, the, the shape of the, of the landscape or the seascape uh, and the position of the coast. But as Judge Hoffman uh, said just yesterday in his, his plenary keynote presentation, uh, climate change was only beginning to arise as the convention was being uh, negotiated um, and that sea level rise was uh, not in the minds of the delegates at that time. I'd say from a geoscientific perspective that would be a bit of a surprise. Um, I'd just to highlight that glacial theory linking the contributions of the cryosphere from glaciers from ice sheets, grounded ice, linking that to the level of the oceans was posited in 1842. And the variability of sea level over geological time scales was generally accepted by the end of the 19th century. But it is true to say that sea level has been generally stable over the last 6,000 years. So against that human memory and context, the drafters were quite correct to be not fully aware of the accelerating changes of sea level. The traditional view as a consequence is the normal baseline, which is the predominant or the default baseline from which we measure zones of maritime jurisdiction was ambulatory. And I like that word because it gives the impression that it wanders around the coastline over time. Uh, and effectively, because the, the normal baseline is coincident with the low waterline along the coast, therefore, as the baseline moves and potentially advances or retreats, then potentially the outer limits of claims to maritime jurisdiction measured from that baseline will also potentially shift. And it's important here to remember that all other straight line type baselines or artificial baselines straight baselines, bay closing lines, archipelagic baselines, are all dependent on the normal baseline. They need to be tied back to the coastline with anchoring points, if you will, on or above the low waterline, the normal baseline. And that view of normal baselines as being ambulatory was the conclusion of the Baselines Committee of the International Law Association in 2018. So that traditional view has been confirmed. At the same time, the ILA gave birth to the International Law Association Committee on International Law and Sea Level Rise, and I'm a member of that committee. And I would say that the convention itself is not blind to 
the issue of dynamic coastlines and does provide for coastal states to be able to fix their baselines in the context, for example, of deltas, where they have an unstable coastline and they're highlighted a little bit that appropriate points on the low water line can be chosen and notwithstanding subsequent regression of the low water line, the straight baseline so, so fixed, uh, they will remain effective and in place. So delegates to the drafters of the convention were conscious of the potential issues created by unstable coastlines, but unaware at that point in time over quite how dynamic coastlines may now become. It's interesting when you see the IPCC reports over time, you see a gradual increase and step up in terms of estimates for potential sea level rise to the end of 2100, to the end of this century, and even more aggressive numbers if we look beyond, for example, to 2050. But you can see in the first assessment report in 1990, so uh, almost a decade after the convention was opened for signature, the IPCC's first report was looking at up to 65 centimetres of sea level rise by the 2100. And now in the, uh, tw the fifth assessment report, we're looking at 90, up to 98 centimetres. And then by the special report on oceans and the cryosphere, in the context of climate change, 1.1 meters by the end of 2100. Now, the, the, Tim Stevens, Professor T. Stevens, he referred to the, I think, the latest IPCC report, which was the, uh, the report published this year on um, impacts, adaptability, uh, and uh, vulnerability. But really, what I'd like to refer to is the physical science basis of the sixth assessment report, which was published in August of last year. And since the report is a mere 3,676 pages long, I, th I hope you'll forgive me for, for cherry picking a, a few of the, the headline statements here where from that sixth assessment report that it's unequivocal that human influence has changed the climate, that there have been unprecedented changes uh, which are going to last centuries to thousands of years, and this is where it gets scary and depressing, uh, that many changes are irreversible for centuries to millennia, uh, and that includes global sea level. These issues are locked in to our future, unfortunately, uh, and that's the scientific perspective. Even more scarily, from my perspective, is that the sixth assessment report does not rule out extreme but low likelihood outcomes such as ice sheet collapse. They cannot be ruled out. Specifically on sea level rise, the sixth assessment report looks at sea level rise over periods of time. And I draw your attention to 1.3 millimeters a year between 1901 and 1971 versus 3.7 millimeters a year, almost three times. Uh, in the 2006 to 2018 period. We are living in a, a century where we are seeing far more aggressive sea level rise than we have previously experienced over the last three millennia. Uh, and it's virtually certain that sea level is committed to rise for centuries to millennia, and that it will remain elevated for thousands of years. With the context of the considerable temporal and uh, spatial variability in sea level globally. So this is the, the slide that my good friend Professor Oral prefers. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a typical Swedish co coastline perhaps, but the fear ultimately is potential inundation and erosion of the coastline at an accelerated rate, meaning loss of land territory, but also maritime jurisdiction. And if we generate some uh, envelopes of arc, these could be a 12 nautical mile territorial sea or a 200 nautical mile limited exclusive economic zone from normal baselines. We naturally may get deposition along the coast and therefore an advance in the baseline and therefore an additional maritime space uh, added to maritime jurisdiction for that particular coastal state. But the fear is a substantial retraction or retreat in the position of normal baseline, ambulation 
backwards, if you will, a loss of land territory where we concentrate population and infrastructure and valuable uh, uh, assets on the coast, and at the same time, a potential significant loss of maritime jurisdiction. Similarly, we, if we change these levels that we're looking at for the definition of what counts as a, an island under Article 121, island or rock, um, or what might, a feature that might count as a low tide elevation now, they may become a, a feature that, that needs to be reclassified from island fully fledged to rock to low tide elevation to a feature that's permanently subsurface with all the implications for maritime jurisdiction that uh, goes with that. I do believe we're in uh, a period of evolution in this particular area of the international law of the sea. I'd concentrate and draw your attention to the practice of the Pacific Island states in particular, small island developing states, the Pacific Oceanscape, the regional plan for the, the states of the Southwest Pacific, really indicates quite explicitly the idea that these states should fix their maritime boundaries amongst themselves to establish stability, but also to fix their maritime claims and declare them with the United Nations Secretary General. And this is essentially what has been happening uh, over time. The light shaded blue states, the maritime jurisdictions there, these are the states that have already deposited uh, coordinates and maps uh, and uh, documents with the United Nations Secretary General through the Division of Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea with the intention through the declarations that they've made to essentially have what we hold, to establish and fix those maritime jurisdictional areas. As an example, the Marshall Islands at the top of the screen there, the legislation itself, the marine legislation of 2016 is relatively brief. The declaration that accompanies it is 451 pages long because it fixes in incredible detail the, out, the baselines, the maritime boundaries, but also the outer limits of territorial sea and exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. Uh, excruciating detail. It's a geographical information systems uh, file made into text and deposited with the United Nations. There have been many declarations by the Pacific Island leaders. I draw your attention particularly to the latest one in August of last year, which is much more explicit in intent. And this is from the conclusion of that declaration on preserving maritime zones in the face of climate change and sea level rise from 6 August, August 2021 that these states proclaim that maritime zones as established and notified to the Secretary General of the UN in accordance with the convention uh, and the rights and entitlements that flow from them shall continue to apply without reduction, notwithstanding any physical changes connected to climate change related sea level rise. Very much a clear statement from these states that they are going to declare and fix their maritime zones. How do we do that? under the convention. I actually think that fixing baselines is probably does the least damage to the convention, but there are no easy answers here. Uh, if one fixes the baseline, uh, then we have territorial sea limit, an EZ limit, and then potentially we have rising sea levels. Then we are, it was mentioned yesterday, the max, maximum of the land dominating the sea. We are establishing a gap between a fixed baseline and the physical reality of the coastline. And that is potentially, of course, problematic and debatable. However, I think it's probably better than the option of fixing, say, the territorial sea limit. And then in the context of sea level rise, you would end up with a retreating baseline, but a fixed territorial sea limit and a broader than 12 mile breadth territorial sea. And similarly, if you did the same with the EEZ limit in the context of sea level rise and a fixed EEZ limit and a retreating baseline, you have uh, a EEZ limit more than 200 nautical miles from baselines and a clear breach of the provisions of the convention. So closing the presentation, I would say 
uh, the International Law Committee on Inter International Law and Sea Level Rise, its resolution in 2018, on the grounds of legal certainty that baselines and outer limits that have been established in accordance with the Convention, uh, they should not be required to be recalculated. So that means it establishes and, and supports the idea that Pacific Island states and other island states, and of course every coastal state is it of it, has an interest here in preserving and protecting their ex existing maritime zones. It is true that the sea level rise was not considered in any detail in the, the third conference on the law of the sea that led to the, the, the UNCLOS, the convention. I think we can detect an evolution in thinking about stability of baselines versus um, ambulatory character baselines. And arguably, I'd say the convention is fit for purpose in that, as Valentina said in her introduction, there is inherent flexibility within the convention to accommodate changing circumstances. There is a little bit of cause for concern I'd highlight at the end in my last minute before I'm threatened with the bell. Um, <laughs> uh, that the, probably one of the only cases that has uh, really been faced with the evidence and uh, argument uh, that sea level rise uh, implications, climate change related sea level rise threatens baselines is Bangladesh's argument in the Bangladesh India arbitration case in 2014. And essentially there the judicial view was that this is not relevant to our, our considerations on delimitation of that maritime boundary. The tribunal essentially said, we're not concerned with where the baselines were in the, historically, and future change on the, as a result of climate change is inherent uncertainty about the estimates, about the projections of sea level rise, and that's, that's a, a fair consideration, but that cannot be taken into account. It's concern over where the baselines, the physical reality of the coastline is at the point at which the delimitation was to take place. And that causes a little bit of concern in my mind over how these issues, this, the, the uh, evidence of potential uh, sea level rise changes and fixing of baselines will be considered by tribunals. Professor Stevens mentioned the, the, it, the potential for an advisory opinion from ITLOS, so we'll have to see how that develops. I think a key issue here is the work of the ILC. I didn't want to go into any d detail here. Uh, Prof Professor Oral may be able to comment, but the way in which the international community reacts to states fixing their baselines, limits, and boundaries, that is the next phase of our considerations. So uh, I, I would invite a comment from our esteemed ILC members as to that particular issue that builds upon this uh, concern of states to fix their maritime limits and boundaries and baselines. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Clive. You have uh, guided us through this very complex issue in, uh, in a matter of a few mi minutes. So thank you for, uh, for that very clear uh, um, explanation of all the different and various uh, uh, aspects of the impacts of uh, sea level rise on the coastlines and therefore also on the baselines that are used to then determine the um, maritime zones. Again, I'm not going to uh, try and, uh, and summarize uh, uh, what Clive just uh, talked to us very eloquently, but uh, indeed something to be uh, uh, considered as different views, ambulatory baselines versus fixed baselines regional uh, state practice is, uh, is developing. Um, the IPCC tells us that this is a problem that is here to stay and it's only gonna get worse. So definitely uh, an issue to be considered for the future, both in terms of um, the extent of the maritime zones, but also the impacts as Clive was saying uh, uh, in relation to maritime boundaries. Um, 
without further ado, and uh, again, in the interest of time and to have some time for uh, questions, I would like now to uh, introduce our last speaker for this panel, at least, Professor Carlos Esposito. The microphone is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for having me. Uh, I would have loved uh, to uh, be there with you today in person and have had the, the pleasure to enjoy the company of our great friends and distinguished colleagues in Singapore. Um, I really want to visit Singapore. <laughs> um, of course, uh, that would have uh, prevented me of the experience of attending a conference and giving a talk in literally the middle of the night here in Spain. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, um, especially to uh, Professor Nilofer Oral, the director of the center um, at NAS, and uh, also to uh, all the team uh, at, at the center, uh, Tara Davenport, uh, Pia Venosa, uh, and all that, the fantastic team there. Um, we are uh, here to celebrate uh, the 40th uh, uh, birthday of UNCLOS, an admirable treaty, uh, a monumental convention. Uh, it achieved uh, the miracle of creating a comprehensive legal framework for the law of the sea, a constitution of the oceans. I have a sincere admiration for the people that made it happen. Some of them are in the room today, including the legendary Ambassador Tommy Co and the Honorable um, Judge Tulio Travers. Um, thank you also to uh, uh, Ambassador and Professor and, and President Tommy retired Tommy Carr for, for the invitation. Okay, uh, the title of this panel is uh, UNCLOS in a Changing World. Um, in, my case, in my case, that expression refers to uh, technological change. Uh, in this brief, uh, very brief presentation, I will first refer to the uses of the word technology in UNCLOS provisions. And this, is, this would be a political dimension of my talk that I, uh, I want to mention because I think it, it's sport. It, it was important um, uh, at the conference, and it's still important today as the discussions on the um, um, uh, negotiations on the uh, on the um, treaty uh, by by um, um, uh, uh, um, Ambassador Lee uh, revealed yesterday. Um, so this brief mention of the, the use of the word technology will, will start my, my talk. And then I will um, say a, a couple of words of uh, UNCLOS and technology uh, on the 21st century. Uh, the question is if uh, UNCLOS is relevant and fit to contribute to solving issues concerning new technologies of the uh, 21st century. Uh, let, let me advance my answer here. My answer to this question is a qualified yes. Indeed, I believe that UNCLOS, as the uh, constitution of the oceans, applies to most of the challenges exposed by new uh, uh, technologies. Uh, this is so because uh, UNCLOS is an umbrella convention conceived as a flexible living instrument with the capacity to adapt to the new circumstances of a changing world. I think that uh, yesterday and today we've heard a lot about that. This, particularly, let me remind the words uh, and the presentation uh, by uh, Judge Thomas Heider uh, yesterday, who, who brilliantly presented the list of ways in which UNCLOS adapts to changes and, and new challenges. The, the, that list uh, included uh, evolutive interpretation, the creation of new legal instruments of implementation, the work of international institutions, um, and those, of course, also the development of the law by international courts and tribunals. Um, and UNCLOS, UNCLOS is not being tested just today by new concerns and new uses of the sea. It has always been, and it has responded fairly well. Um, I will come back to that in a few uh, minutes. But let me first uh, go into the uh, first dimension, this uh, um, cultural, political, um, economic dimension of my talk. Uh, 
because when we talk about technology, we have to uh, tackle the, uh, those dimensions as, as well. It's not just a uh, juridical or legal technical questions that we are dealing with here. So um, the word technology, well, that's, uh, that's a word from the, from the Greek, techne, meaning skill, and logos, meaning reason. It could be applied to almost everything. In the law of the sea, technology has always, always been uh, present in so many ways. Uh, technology was an important concern in the law of the sea, of course, as a consequence uh, of the uh, advancement uh, of the seabed mining technologies. But technology uh, was not, however, a word that appeared in many scholarly titles in the, in the uh, 1950s and 1960s. Um, not even in the 1970s, uh, at least together with the uh, uh, law of the sea expression. Uh, there is a book by William Burke published in 1966 called Ocean Sciences, Technology and the Future of International Law of the Sea. And also an article with the title Technology and the Sea by Douglas Johnston published in, uh, in 1967 in the California Law Review. Uh, if you read that article, you will, you will uh, notice that he uh, refers to uh, um, scientific di discoveries and, and technical innovations, and I quote, that have projected the exciting possibility of radical solutions and improvements arising out of new and expanded uses of the sea. That's 1967. But, and, and he uh, referred to uh, particular uh, technologies, for example, flight, uh, electronics, food, uh, applied to food, uh, nuclear energy uh, was a big issue. Um, um, government and private investors, uh, he said, started to uh, uh, convert uh, these uh, uh, ideas and, and even fantasies into concrete projects in those uh, um, in, 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 in those uh, years. Well, but if you if we if we look at Unclos, what was the issue at Unclos? The issue at Unclos uh, uh, and the word technology appears explicitly uh, in part, especially in part 14 of the convention, which provides a framework for transfer of technologies under Unclos. So uh, if we read those articles, article uh, of part 14, of, for example, article 266, um, well, those are articles uh, and uh, that obliges states to, I quote, cooperate in accordance with their capabilities to promote actively the uh, development and transfer of marine science and marine uh, technology on fair and reasonable terms and conditions. Um, this could be done um, or, or, or was expected to be done also through um, um, competent international organizations um, and, and, of course, um, bilateral, multilateral cooperation. But the, uh, the uh, question, the, the, the point that I want to make is that um, this was the issue, the, 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 one of the main issues uh, that explicitly uh, referring to, uh, to technology um, in, in UNCLOS. And uh, this, the, this part uh, uh, is, is uh, well, uh, there's consensus that this part has been deficiently implemented. Of course, the, the, there was uh, this uh, um, development, um, the uh, Intergovernmental Oceanogra uh, Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO comply with the requirement of Article 271 in establishing a generally accepted guidelines criteria and standards for the transfer of marine technology. But uh, even if these guidelines um, define marine technology in very broad terms, and uh, uh, as uh, um, Professor Ronald Long has uh, said in, in one of his pieces, it provided a, uh, a, a, a normative or a conceptual framework for, for, for uh, um, technology transfers. The, the fact is that the, uh, the implementation it, it's, it was uh, or is deficient uh, in, in so many ways. Um, the, if, if, if we look, for example, at the, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, implementation, a, a 1994 implementation agreement, there's also another, uh, another example of, uh, of um, 
let's say, uh, I wouldn't say failure, but uh, of, of a certain amendment of the, uh, um, of onclos, because uh, if, in, in, uh, in, the, in, in that agreement, mm -hmm, in that agreement, uh, the um, um, mandatory transfer of technology that was provided for in Article 5 of Annex uh, 3 UNCLOS was uh, disapplied by, by Section 5.2 of the Implementation Agreement. And, and so we have another example there of, of uh, not only of uh, the fishing implementation, but of you know, a, a change or a modification or, of a, or, or, or a, an amendment of the uh, um, um, general consensus uh, arrived at uh, UNCLOS. And this has to be, uh, has, uh, of course, a, a direct relationship with what was uh, with the idea that uh, Judge you know, Rudiger uh, Borfrum uh, mentioned yesterday on the common heritage of, uh, 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 on the principle of common heritage of humanity. Um, I want to uh, underscore these uh, ideas because there, there is now an opportunity uh, for the, uh, of course, for the Intergovernmental Conference on the uh, BBNJ uh, to uh, provide a, a new, uh, new uh, rules and flesh to uh, um, uh, transfer of, te uh, of technologies and uh, perhaps also um, learn from uh, other experiences in, in the uh, uh, um, area of um, international um, uh, environmental law uh, treaties. And uh, come back to the idea of uh, uh, Ambassador Tommy Carr um, that was also <laughs> cited by Ronald Long in, 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 a, in an introduction to a panel, a very interesting panel on um, um, ma uh, marine um, uh, scientific research. Uh, it, the, these words uh, 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 were, mentioned, were, were pronounced by uh, Ambassador Ko uh, at, at the conference. And, and I would like to quote them to, to finish this part. It says, and I quote, although the convention consists of a series of compromises, they form an integral whole. This is why the conventions does not provide for reservations. It is therefore not possible for states to pick what they like and disregard what they do not like. In international law, as in domestic law, rights and duties go hand in hand. It is therefore legally impermissible to claim rights under the convention without being willing to assume correlative duties. Now, my second point, law and technology, the ch challenges, the new challenges, um, well, I advance, I already advanced my, my point, and uh, I, want, I, I would like to um, uh, add here that I was not surprised uh, when um, many people um, reporting uh, for the uh, U UK uh, um, um, Parliament uh, um, expressed a similar point of view, for example, in paragraph uh, 240 of, of, of such report, a very interesting report uh, in which uh, the, the question was if uh, UNCLOS was uh, fit uh, for, for the future and also uh, which were the, uh, um, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the challenges uh, for, for UNCLOS and, and, the, and the law of the sea. Uh, for example, um, Professor Evans affirmed that the law, and I quote, the law of the sea has always changed quite dramatically in the light of changing ideas of technology. Uh, and, and he also said that absolutely, absolutely, absolutely nothing new uh, about uh, um, that. Uh, uh, he said, our approach to legal regulation changing as technology changes uh, is there in, 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 in the fact that there are new technologies. So, um, What are the uh, ways in which um, the relationship between new technologies and UNCLOS could be under, uh, 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 understood? 
one thing, and I and I continue with this the, this report because it's very interesting. Some of the people in this room have uh, actively participated in the in the in the report with uh, either with uh, uh, written statements or, or uh, such as, for example, Professor Klein with a very interesting um, um, opinions uh, on on many issues on on the on UNCLOS and 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 its challenges. Um, as I said in the report, at some point the the there is a question to uh, a um, um, commander uh, of um, of the uh, uh, Royal Navy, uh, Commander Tuckett, and uh, well, uh, the question is, how do you uh, proceed without uh, or in the absence of international agreements and regulations? And on the use of uh, maritime um, um, autonomous uh, vehicles. And uh, Commander Tucker uh, well, uh, deals with the questions very um, uh, wisely, in my view, because uh, um, it seems that what the, uh, the uh, lawyers of the Royal Navy uh, uh, are doing is what I, uh, I would have do or any illegal uh, advisor would have uh, uh, um, done in, 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 in their approach to this question. It, it's, well, we see these things through the application of, or, uh, of Article 31, through the lens of Article 31 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. And in this sense, uh, well, uh, we uh, um, take into account the textual uh, uh, interpretation, the contextual interpretation, and the theological interpretation of uh, such treaty, and, uh, and produce uh, um, a, an interpretation that is in accordance with the principles of UNCLOS. And how do we do this? Also, it's uh, well uh, through the application of the uh, principle of uh, uh, um, equivalence. I would like to. Uh, would like to uh, give a couple of more examples in these uh, in these directions. Look, if we um, if we uh, look at the uh, many um, um, ways in which, uh, for example, yesterday um, uh, Judge uh, Haider talked about uh, Anklos adapting to uh, to new situations, to changes, to changing situations. You might remind that, for example, the uh, the uh, um, um, courts and tribunals developing the law. Uh, for example, in this sense, I would mention uh, the uh, um, the um, arbitral uh, tribunal um, um, decision on the Arctic sunrise in 2015. In, in such decision, uh, the arbitral tribunal held that the parameters of the right of hot pursuit must be interpreted in the light of their object and purpose, having regard to the modern use of technology mm -hmm, and that VHF messages presently, uh, uh, presently constitute the, uh, the standard means of uh, communication between ships at sea and can fulfill the functions of informing the pursued ship. Um, well, this is just one example, evol evolutionary interpretation and uh, another could be Refer, uh, uh, using rules of reference uh, or even um, the progressive development of the law either by uh, uh, courts and tribunals or by institutions uh, uh, and uh, Clive um, mentioned the, uh, um, the uh, contributions of the uh, International Law Commission in this sense. Um, if we look for example in at all of these, not only, for example, sea level rise issues, but also issues such as, for example, the, uh, the UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage. There we see another kind of uh, relationship with technology. Why? Well, because their technology um, made um, the, advance, uh, the advances on technologies made possible um, new ways of protecting um, uh, underwater cultural heritage. Uh, in the preamble of, of, of such uh, um, um, convention, we, we read, uh, and I quote, aware of the availability of advanced technology that enhances discovery and 
of and access of to underwater cultural heritage. Before such advancements, the, the, uh, the protection of, of underwater cultural heritage was um, very um, uh, difficult or even impossible. Um, I will finish with a, the most tricky question or perhaps the, the, the most tricky uh, uh, example uh, uh, of uh, new technologies. Because this was, this is really, or this could really be, not, um, not uh, just uh, problematic, but even uh, contradictory in, sometimes with the convention. This is the case of uh, uh, maritime autonomous vehicles. I've heard that you talk about this in the previous se section. But I, I, I couldn't uh, join. Uh, I'm sorry. It was. Uh, um, at three o'clock in the morning uh, here in Spain, and I, I couldn't make it. But uh, which are the legal issues here at, at stake? Well, there are many. Uh, first of all, the, 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 the definition and legal status of these vehicles. Uh, UNCLOS uh, seems to limit, uh, for example, the, uh, the uh, uh, name of vessels uh, um, to a certain kind of vessels or crafts uh, with a crew. And here, uh, well, we have a really um, um, uh, opposite case. Huh? Um, the um, question here is, uh, well, what are our states doing? Well, there's, there's not much practice because not many um, uh, states have developed these, uh, these technologies, but there are many kinds of um, um, Mm, maritime autonomous vehicles. For example, um, in, in the civilian or non-military uh, non -military, uh, uh, context, we have um, um, uh, vehicles uh, that uh, mm, uh, are using commercial salvage and aquaculture and, uh, uh, and um, uh, undersea cable deployment and inspection or in offshore oil and gas emissions. In the military, oh, that, that is the, the most important uh, field, perhaps, uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, when, when it comes to regulation. And this uh, would include um, uh, surveillance, uh, would include uh, also uh, mine neutralization or mine warfare, and so on and so forth. So the, the question here is, what are the limits of the principle of equivalence? Uh, and can we, do, uh, can we apply this until we reach a consensus um, to create a new um, um, treaty uh, or a new instrument, uh, that, that is the challenge. And for example, in, in that case, we will have to decide um, how um, we apply, for example, the principle of nationality to these uh, vehicles uh, or, and the principle of sovereign immunity. How uh, can we decide issue, issues such as um, the um, um, uh, navigational rights of, uh, of um, foreign, uh, um, foreign uh, maritime autonomous vehicles in the different uh, um, um, uh, sea areas. Hmm? I'm uh, so sorry, this, Carlos, to interrupt. Yes. Uh, we're just running is... out of time. Okay. Uh, so I do so, apologize. No, 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 no please no just problem. Uh, finish no up problem. and then we can go to questions. Okay. I'm... Yes. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't um, hear the, the bell. <laughs> yes, I know, I rang, uh, there's something wrong with that the bell is not going through Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I was, I was uh, waiting for the bell and just talked. I'm sorry about that. So I, I just leave it there. I, I think that I've said uh, that I've, 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 I've uh, developed my two points, the, uh, the more political one and, uh, and the more technical one. Um, thank you very much for your attention. So, Thank Valentina, you. if we can go um, straight to questions, that would be Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I was going to propose that. And sorry, I also didn't hear the bell through uh, Zoom. So, let's uh, uh, move to the QA session. And I understand we have uh, an MC in the room who will help us with uh, giving the microphone to people who have a question. So, are there any questions from the audience? Would anyone like, uh, oh yes, please, um, Dorota, if you could use the mic. This is uh, Dorota from uh, IMO. 
thank you very much. Thank you uh, to all panelists for this uh, very, very interesting panel. And uh, of course, I could not resist but to comment on Jonas' uh, presentation, which is, of course, very important. And the uh, plastic pollution is absolutely of utmost importance for all of us. Um, just, it, it's not really a question, it's, it's a comment that the MEPC uh, in November 2021 adopted the strategy to address uh, marine plastic litter uh, from ships and this strategy, although it's true that it doesn't necessarily uh, directly refer to UNCLOS, but it does uh, refer to uh, strategic uh, goal, the, the Sustainable Development Goal 14, which refers to UNCLOS, yes? So, so and, and again, this point that there is a harmony and, and the system is uh, uh, harmonious and, and complementary. Uh, and to uh, the specific question of uh, the fishing gear, uh, the uh, PPR subcommittee is meeting uh, from the like, next week, yes, from the 4th to 8th of April. And there is a legal advice provided by my office on the, on the fishing gear on which we spent considerable amount of time. And it's only six pages because we have six pages limits for our documents. Otherwise it would be 60 pages, but I encourage all of you to read the document PPR 915.6. It's, it's very interesting. And if you would like to discuss the uh, fishing gear and disposal into the sea, I'm more than happy to, to, to take it further. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for your presentation. It was brilliant. Mm, uh, sorry, uh, anyone else has a question? Oh, um, thank you. Thank you uh, mm. for the amazing panel. And I would invite um, Professor Schofield since he raised this important and current issue of um, sea level rise and on stable coastline. I'm sure he's been doing a lot of work on that but, uh, in that area. But for the purposes of this audience, could you please elaborate um, as briefly as possible on the principles of the limitation, including the bisector principle, is, if, if it's possible, as I say, and for the purposes of this audience. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Judge Karama. Uh, that's a, an excellent question, but hard to uh, achieve in a very limited period of time. But in, t in terms of the, the now generally accepted principles of delimitation, we have uh, the so-called three-step or three-stage process, which was best articulated or first articulated in the 2009 International Court of Justice Black Sea case decision, the first stage of which uh, is the geometric construction of an equidistance-based line. I won't say a strict equidistance line because an, uh, in no occasion where the three-stage process has been applied has a strict equidistance line been uh, constructed by the court. The judges have always had discretion over which base points to use, appropriate points on the coast for the construction of the uh, important first stage equidistance baseline, then at the second stage to take into account the uh, relevant circumstances that would lead to an adjustment of that line, uh, and then at the third stage, a slightly illusory third stage, I'd say, of the disproportionality considerations, because I, I genuinely think tribunals and courts tend to take that into account in the second stage of the process, and you don't end up with a decision which the judges find that they've made the wrong choice and then need to adjust it at the third stage. So I think that's some, somewhat absorbed into the second stage. The bisector idea, that, 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 that's, a, that's a really good way to highlight the limits of the three-stage process, where you, particularly the Honduras-Nicaragua case, where you are dealing with a convex coastline, and a river mouth as the terminal point of the land boundary and a substantially unstable coastline with the river mouth building out and building out into the Caribbean Sea over time and an extremely small proportion of each state's coastline at that 
river mouth, and the, the heads of the river on each side controlling a provisional equidistance line, you could get huge variation in that equidistance line at, at that first stage if you applied the three-stage process. So the court in that context, as you probably extremely well know, um, instead approximated the general direction of each state's coastline and uh, projected a bisector of those general directions of the coast offshore, taking into account the small islands offshore being accorded a 12 nautical miles semi-enclave. So that was an innovative way to, as it were, sidestep the, the or deal with the problem of an extremely unstable coastline uh, with only tiny parts of each state's coastal front actually controlling an equidistance line, a way to take into account the whole of each state's co coastal front and in a sense generalize that and with a bisector that in a way of thinking is a, is a, a modified or a, 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 a kind of a approximated equidistance between those to coastal projections. Okay, um, Nilifa has a question. Thank you very much. I want to first start off by thanking Valentina. It's very late in New York. You're up very late. And Carlos, you're up extraordinarily early. <laughs> so we're really grateful for this, you know, your sacrifice to be with us. And also- Sorry if I made some mistakes. <laughs> this fantastic <laughs> panel that we've had. Very quick, we're running out of time, unfortunately. But Carlos, my question is to you, and it builds upon an earlier question. There is um, a transfer of technology mechanism under the climate change regime. Yet we're really, part 14, again, is an amazing achievement. There's nothing else like it in other conventions. Very clear uh, guidelines or obligations. Is it a mechanism we're missing to activate uh, this Part 14? I know you mentioned BBNJ, but, but how can we make it more effective, Part 14? Thank you. I wish I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Sincerely, I wish I knew. Um, the, I, I think that the challenge, I asked that question, I, could, I couldn't make it uh, uh, to, to Ambassador Lee. I asked that question uh, in, 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 with regard to, uh, to, to the, to the uh, um, uh, new treaty. Uh, but, well, the, the, uh, the clearing house uh, could help and the establishing uh, a, a um, truly effective cooperation between um, different um, uh, actors and, uh, and trying to involve all the stakeholders can also help. The question of, uh, by Professor Ronald Long uh, yesterday is it's also uh, relevant. I'm sorry I don't have a, 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 an easy answer to, to this question. I think it takes a lot of uh, uh, co cooperation. I think it takes uh, um, uh, uh, also uh, a, a uh, principal uh, stand uh, when it comes to uh, viewing the, uh, the, the law of the sea and the oceans as a matter that concerns every, uh, everybody and not just a few. And, uh, perhaps also uh, dealing with uh, the problem of um, um, dissemination or um, lacking a, uh, a proper coordination between uh, the, um, uh, the stakeholders. And when I say this, I, 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 I want to recall that it's not just the owners of the uh, uh, technologies that are faulty, but sometimes also the developing states that are not, uh, for example, asking or doing um, uh, enough to create imaginative uh, solutions. I can recall, for example, in other areas, as you mentioned, Nilfer, 
in other areas of, of international law, uh, such as environmental international law, there are cooperations between private actors and states in order to uh, put up projects of uh, uh, shared technology and shared uh, benefits. Um, for example, concerning um, bio uh, uh, technology and uh, resources uh, of the sea. Thanks. Thank you. And I think we have a question for uh, Yona. Uh, one last question for Yona, and maybe a question um, for Clive, just uh, to very briefly answer. The question for Yona is, since China imposed a ban on export of plastic waste, the ASEAN region has become an attractive destination for plastic waste, illegal transportation of plastic waste. Do you think that Singapore can play a significant role in the ASEAN region to address this issue by collaboration and cooperation with ASEAN member states? especially by building waste treatment plants in member states. The question for Clive um, is, uh, how long do you think it will take for the animated simulations of changes in maritime zones uh, to happen or be detectable? Or are we just thinking too much ahead? Also, is the ability for, of a state to identify such changes on a case-to-case -case situation depending on technology capacities? Do they depend on technology capacities? And I think we can answer that and then close. You want to go first? Yep. Thank you, uh, and uh, thank you for the question. Um, I did not talk about the region, though this is most of the work I do, actually, in the context of marine plastics. Um, and it's uh, the short answer is yes. <laughs> Um, I think Singapore can play an important role uh, and has already been, um, as I have seen, uh, in terms of uh, organizing and helping uh, capacity building in the region. There's, uh, there's a substantive amount of work done uh, in the context of the ASEAN and the context of COPSI. Um, the, the region in the last uh, 10 years has gone through, actually not 10, even five, it's been remarkably fast has really um, upped their game in terms of um, knowledge of the issues, um, scientific knowledge as well as uh, policy development of solutions. And, uh, um, and it's just about continuing to push so that there are solutions. I'm actually a big believer of uh, regional uh, mechanisms to um, implement the international um, framework. Uh, and that's certainly where the region can, and Singapore can, can play a role uh, for uh, capacity building is a very important part. Um, and building plants, yes, certainly. Well, if the neighbors want so, <laughs> they would certainly would have to go through a certain amount of, um, of discussion. Um, but yes, I think that's the simple answer. Thank you very much indeed, Tara, um, and thank you for the question. As I understood it, it was linking the technology to observing coastal change over time, uh, and that links directly to, to capacity building, absolutely. Uh, there is, we're, we're now in a world where we have access to extremely high resolution, sub-meter satellite imagery and indeed four-dimensional aspects to it. You can see the satellite imagery, uh, the changes in the coastline over time through the use of that type of technology. In terms of access to that sort of technology, which is what coastal states really require, the sort of regional capacity building exercise that has taken place in the Pacific, the Pacific Maritime Boundaries Project, has provided a, a level playing field, if you will, in terms of access to that type of technology, and therefore it acts as a form of confidence building mechanism on a regional basis in order to support uh, all of the small island developing states in the Southwest Pacific to provide a forum for discussion between them, but also that confidence in the location of baselines and therefore uh, any maritime zones and maritime delimitation lines, equidistance lines that are calculated from those baselines. So that's the sort of, you know, regional capacity building that has been extremely successful. And in a 10-year period, we've gone, we've essentially doubled the number of 
delimited agreed maritime boundaries in the Pacific. We've gone from about a third of maritime boundaries being delimited to 75% in the per period 2005 to 2015. I would just end, if I may, with the, the discretion of Dr. Tara, uh, with something of a plea in relation to technology. I absolutely agree with, with Carlos that there is a great opportunity for linkage of technology transfer and capacity building in the BBNJ agreement. My plea really relates to the way in which spatial technologies have changed, and we have access to those high resolution images of where the coastline, the reality of the coastline is. And yet, when we look at recent cases before international courts and tribunals, and this plea is not necessarily to the judges, although awareness is, is good to have there, it's to the parties to cases. We've seen multiple cases that rely on admiralty charts of old uh, charts of inappropriate scale. The UN uh, group of experts on baselines in 1989 indicated that when using charts, we should be using at best one to 50,000 to 100, one to 200,000 scale charts. In recent cases, we've had, uh, the parties have ended up relying on charts of one to 350,000 scale for Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire and S Somalia, Kenya. That means that one millimeter line on the chart is 350 meters on the ground. And you have charts where, which are in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, the survey along the coastline itself was from the 1840s to 1870s. For Somalia, Kenya, the Somali, relevant Somali coastline was surveyed by the Italian Navy in 1942 for the date, providing the data on the chart relied on. The Kenyan coastline, British Admiralty surveys from 1961 to 64. So 60 to 80 years old data relied on at an inappropriate scale. Uh, and yet it's not the court's fault if the parties rely on th those charts in their evidence. But the reality is that there is a need for technical perspective and input that can take into account the potential errors that can result from relying on old and inappropriate scale data in the, the, the reaching of a final and binding decision of an international court. So I'll leave it there, but thank you very much. Really, it's just that we are facing an issue of the law struggling to catch up to very rapidly changing technology. Thank you. Valentina, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Tara, for moderating this uh, question and answer. Thank you very much for all the questions and the excellent answers. Just very briefly, because I understand that you're all heading to your lunch, and I don't want to cut it short. We've heard about many impacts from different drivers of change in the marine environment, including the cumulative impacts. We also have heard that Anclox as leading instruments provides the flexibility to address new challenges in our changing world. And of course, it relies on a number of uh, complementary instruments and frameworks that are developed to address such new issues. The good news is that there are a number of processes now uh, addressing some of the challenges that we've heard about. So for marine biodiversity, we have the BBNJ IGC. For marine plastics, we have UNEA, uh, a new uh, negotiating process starting soon, but also the work under IMO, the FAO, and uh, in relation to uh, sea level rise, we have heard about the work of the ILC. And I would like to recall also that the General Assembly for the Consultative Process on Oceans and Love the Sea dealt with the impacts of sea level rise in its uh, meeting last year. Um, so there is work being done to address all these uh, challenges. Uh, again, I don't want to hold anyone from their uh, well-deserved lunch. I just want to conclude uh, uh, thanking the organizers, in particular, again, Ambassador Go and uh, Nilufer, <coughs> but also Tara and Pia. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. <coughs> 
Uh, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, opportunity to be here with all of you, even from afar. I want to thank our four panelists for the excellent presentations and for sharing with us uh, their enormous expertise in these uh, subjects. It's been a pleasure to be here with you today. And the uh, last word is bon appétit. And good night to Professor uh, Thank you so much, Valentina and Carlos. I know it's uh, ungodly hours for you, so we're very much appreciative. Thank you. It was fun. <laughs>